Mr. Donish, Dr. Donish. Yes, sir. Yeah, we are good to go in uh, Zoom sir, as well as in Facebook. You can start. Okay, sir, but I am not able to see. Uh, I mean, uh, my screen or because uh, it is saying that you are being yeah, John Wesley's sir, screen. Yeah, you don't worry. Uh, when you speak, we'll be able to see. You start. Okay. Okay, sir. Hello. Peter, you can start. Okay. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalms chapter 73 verse 26 A very good afternoon to everybody I Mrs Sheetal Pal Charan nursing tutor at Christian College of Nursing welcomes each and every one of you to the webinar entitled to challenges and new frontiers in drug discovery organized by Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences Shalom Institute of Health and Allied Sciences Shuwats To begin with I request Dr. Richmond Samuel, University Chaplain for Opening Prayer. A very good afternoon to all of you. I would like to read from the Bible, Proverbs chapter 25, verses 2, 3, and 4. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out like the heavens for height like the earth for depth so the mind of kings is unsearchable take away the dross from the silver and the smith has material for a vessel let us look our lord in prayer gracious heavenly father we come into thy presence we are thankful and grateful to you for this wonderful opportunity of coming together and to participate in these two days international webinar that is challenges and new frontiers in drug discovery, which has been organized by Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences under Shalom Institute of Sam Higginbottom University of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences. We are thankful, Lord, that we are able to address this very important issue as the whole world is working hard. The scientists, the economists, the intellectuals are working very hard in finding new drugs or new vaccine for this corona virus. And there we find that how, how much challenge that they are facing. And similarly, as are people engaged in any type of drug <coughs> discovery related to anything that is related to our health, we know, Lord, that many undergo various challenges. But we know, Lord, that through this two days international webinar, we will be able to be equipped what we are doing and we will envision what we have to do further. Lord, grant us your intelligence and wisdom as we move forward in this particular field. We are thankful for all the participants who have enrolled themselves, registered themselves from different parts of country and different parts of the world. And we pray that through this webinar, many be blessed. We come especially the speakers into your mighty hand as they deliver important theme, uh, topic, Lord, in this uh, webinar and a subject, whatever the subject they are going to speak, we pray that, that you will guide them through the power of the Holy Spirit. And they may, they may share the expertise that may equip our students and staff members and those who are participating. We are thankful, Lord, for the organizing committee 
Dr. Malai Rajan, and along with him, other members, deans, staff members, and students who have worked hard in organizing this, this particular webinar. We ask your blessing upon them. We pray for our chief guest on this occasion as he shares something very significant to all of us. Lord, we pray that your blessing be upon him. We pray for Dr. Wesley as he is working hard in coordinating with the internet connections and other things and organizing this webinar, helping each uh, colleges. We pray that you bless engineer Wesley at this moment and his whole team so that they may able to connect with others without any problem. We continue to pray for our university that your blessing be upon our university, your blessing be upon our honorable vice chancellor, sir, and all the officials, staff members, and students, that your precious hand be upon them. Especially as the world is facing this COVID-19, we may stand strong and face the challenges related to it and be a blessing and a hope for the world. We give you honor and glory and commit these two days of seminar, uh, webinar into your mighty hand. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, sir, for sharing the word of God with us. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request Dr. P. Malay Rajan, Associate Dean and Head of Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Sihas Shuvats, for the welcome address. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the organizing committee, I take this privilege to welcome the gathering. I firstly welcome our Honorable Vice Chancellor of our University, Right Reverend Professor Dr. Rajendra B. Lal, who is a visionary. He envisioned Allahabad Agricultural Institute to become a degree awarding university and made his dream come true. He is a special interest in academic development and researches. He is also a great support in organizing such a co-curricular activities. I welcome you, sir. I also welcome our pro vice chancellor, Professor Dr. A.K. Lawrence, the chief guest of the international webinar, who works tirelessly to take care of the academic standards of our university. He also greatly encourages in our academic activities as well as special program like this. I welcome our pro vice chancellor, Professor Dr. S. B. Lal, administration who gives enormous support for the growth of Faculty of Health Sciences. Hearty welcome to Professor Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Sarvajit Herbert, Planning, Monitoring, Development, who extends his spiritual and moral support in every way. I welcome our registrar, Professor Dr. Robin L. Prasad, for standing with us and encouraging us in our academic journey. I welcome our beloved Dean of our faculty, Dr. Sega, for leading us for his kind and support for the faculty. I welcome our joint registrar, Engineer C. John Wesley, who contributes for all the programs of our university with his technical insight and uh, is the chairman of social media. We welcome you, sir. I welcome all the dignitaries, respected directors, deans, heads of various departments, professors, their colleagues, researchers, my dear student participant from India and abroad. I welcome one and all for this webinar. Now with, this is my duty to introduce the speakers from various country. Now I cordially welcome distinguished speaker, Professor David Grave, School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, Center for Experimental Medicine, Queen's University, Belfast, Northern Ireland, Ireland, UK. He is an eminent scientist working on cardiovascular system. Warm welcome to Dr. Wahajuddin, working with the Division of Pharmaceutics and Pharmacokinetics, Central Drug Research Institute, Lucknow, hey, India. Hey, hey. He is expert in pharmacokinetics, aspects of drug molecules of CSIR, CDRA, drug R&D pipeline, 
in addition to marketed drug and metabolized natural product. I welcome you, sir. I welcome my former colleague and my friend, Dr. Himanshu Pandey. Now he's a director, Center for Teacher Education, Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Saranath Varanasi, India. He is expert in nanotechnology-based formulation. He is long associated with SWATS. I welcome you, sir. I welcome Professor Dr. Parhan Jali Sahamad, Department of Pharmaceutics, School of Pharmaceutical Education and Research, Jami Hamdad, New Delhi. I welcome you, sir. He is expert in development, scale-up, technology transfer, launching of pharmaceutical products, both for national and international markets. Dr. Fargan Sali Sahamad is also expert in nano formulation technique. My hearty welcome to Dr. Musafar Iqbal, is Associate Professor, School of Pharmacy, King South University, Riyadh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He is expert in handling of sophisticated instruments, bioanalytical method development and validation, drug metabolism, pharmacokinetics, biochemical and molecular pharmacology. I welcome you, sir. My warm welcome to Professor G.S. Sukla, Director, School of Health Science, Uttar Pradesh, Rastri Tandon Open University, Prayak Raj. He is professional experience as a homeopathic physician for more than 26 years. Professor Sukla is expert in alternative system of medicine. I welcome you, sir. Now, I want to give a brief introduction about the Department of Pharmaceutical Science. Department of Pharmaceutical Science has started in the year 2002. Since then, the department is growing. Department of Pharmaceutical Science offers DPharm, DPharm, MPharm in Pharmaceutics, and PhD in Pharmaceutical Science. By the grace of God Almighty, dedicated service of all our faculty members and the support of the management, the Department of Pharmaceutical Science reached a new height, consequently of earning 56 NIRF rank in India, 15 Uttar Pradesh state awarded by National Institute of Ranking Framework, that is NIRF MHRD. Our potential students are from India, Nepal, and Nigeria. I want to give, give a brief about this, uh, uh, that is drug discovery, so that you can able to understand that today's and tomorrow's topic. So before we hear from the experts, on the webinar topic, challenges and new frontiers in drug discovery. Let me brief the di uh, drug discovery and development process of each phase consisting of number one, identification of new target molecules, that is biomarker discovery. It may be from the plant, it may be from synthetic or it may be a semi-synthetic route, that is discovery phase. Number two, studies on microorganism and animals, that is preclinical pre development phase. And number three, testing the new medicine in the targeted population by a stage-wise clinical trials, that is clinical developmental stage. Number four, bring them into a market, that is authorization and the commercialization. The speakers will be enlightening us in this area. I thank you and uh, I'll be uh, requesting the appeal uh, be listened to this today's topic so that you can be able to beneficial about this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the welcome address. I now request engineer C. John Weasley, the Joint Registrar Administration, Head, University Publication Division, and Chairman Athletics Committee, Social Media Committee, for the university introduction. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Sheetal. Uh, respected chief guest, uh, Professor Dr. A.K. Lawrence, Pro A. Chancellor, AQA, uh, distinguished speakers of uh, the international webinar and my dear participants, 
Samig Important University of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences, Schwartz, earlier known as Allahabad Agriculture Institute, was established in the year 1910 under the leadership of Dr. Sam Higginbottom. The institution has completed more than 110 years of dedicated and relentless services to the nation uh, with its vision and mission, gospel and plow, and its motto, feed the hungry and serve the land. Under the dynamic leadership of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Most Reverend Professor Rajendra Bilal, Allahabad Agriculture Institute was conferred the deemed to be university status by the Ministry of Human Resource Development uh, Government of India in the year 2000. It was later renamed during its centenary year as Sam Bottom Institute of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences deemed to be university by Ministry of Human Resource Development Government of India uh, to honor the founder, Dr. Sam Bottom. After considering the adequate availability of teaching, non-teaching, staff and other essential infrastructure facilities, the Uttar Pradesh legislature decided to upgrade, reconstitute and establish Shiats as a full-fledged university under state act. Hence, now we are called as Sam Bottom University of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences. Shiats is a united endeavor of Christian community in India for promoting rural life and development in conformity with the Christian vision of humankind and the creation. The university is held in trust as a common ecumenical heritage by the Christian churches and church organizations of the country. It seeks to be a national center of professional excellence in education and service to the people with the participation of students and faculty members from all over India and abroad. The university operates with faculty of agriculture, engineering and technology, science, business studies, theology, animal husbandry, humanities, education, film and mass communication, and health sciences. The university strives to prepare its students to take their places as farm managers, agriculture scientists, agriculture officers, extension workers, managers, educationists, agriculture biotechnologists, microbiologists, biochemists, engineers, software professionals, dairy technologists, nutritionists, theologians, and pharmacists. Schwartz, an ISO 9001-2015 certified institution, is a recognized member of Association of Indian Universities, Indian Agriculture Universities Association, International Association of Universities, All India Association for Christian Higher Education, Association for Common Health Universities, Asia Pacific, Association of Agriculture Research Institutions, Global Consortium of Higher Education and Research for Agriculture, Trust for Advancement of Agriculture Sciences, Global Forum on Agriculture Research, Asian Association of Agriculture Colleges and Universities. Uh, Schwartz has signed uh, many MOUs on academics and research collaborations with national and international reputed institutions. NAC, uh, National Assessment and Accreditation Council, accredited our university with A grade in the year 2013. In 2014, MHRD Government of India placed Schwartz, uh, then we were deemed university in that year uh, among the A grade institutions deemed universities in, in the country. Nani Agriculture Institute of Schwartz is also accredited by Indian Council of Agriculture Research in New Delhi. Currently, we have 13,000 students pursuing their higher education on campus. We have more than uh, 2,000 teaching, non-teaching faculty members across all over the country. Uh, with these words, I would like to welcome each one of you on behalf of Sam Bottom University of Agriculture Technology Sciences and wish you all a wonderful experience through this international webinar today and tomorrow. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Sheetal. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for briefing us about the university. Now I humbly request our chief guest, Professor Dr. A.K.A. Lawrence, Pro Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs and Quality Assurance for the Chief Guest Speech. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Sheetal Charan. Uh, on this outset, I would like to uh, address Professor David uh, Grieve, uh, Dr. Bahajuddin, Dr. Uh, Himanshu Pandey, Professor Farhan uh, Jalis Ahmed, uh, Dr. Muzaffar Iqbal, Professor Shukla, 
the participants in this international uh, webinar, uh, Dean of FGLC, the head of the department, uh, faculty members, and uh, students of the Department of uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences of uh, Sam Higginbottom University of Agriculture, Technology, and uh, Sciences. I am uh, indeed uh, very pleased to be a part of uh, this international webinar on challenges uh, and uh, new frontiers in drug uh, discovery being uh, organized by the Department of Pharmaceutical uh, Sciences of Faculty of Health Science of our university. Uh, we are uh, extremely happy and thankful to the Lord for his abundant blessings and mercies upon all of us through this institution of God. Uh, this uh, pioneer uh, professional institution has successfully traveled 110 years. And today, uh, as a multi-faculty state uh, uh, university, it stands uh, as a dedicated and relentless service provider to the state, nation, and to the world with one of its important faculty of uh, health sciences. Now, uh, the uh, drug uh, development, uh, in fact, uh, is a lengthy and complex and uh, class, uh, costly process enriched uh, with a high degree of uncertainty that a drug will actually succeed. Now, it, it also travels uh, through several steps evaluating its uh, safety, efficacy, potency, uh, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics, first in animals and then in uh, mammals. And therefore, a drug faces many challenges during its development. And I think today's uh, uh, webinar in, uh, is an important one, which will certainly uh, focus on the hurdles and challenges uh, that, are, that a drug could face uh, during the uh, entire journey of its uh, development. And I wish all the experts uh, for the seminar all the very best and uh, hope that the participants will gain imperative knowledge about challenges and in drug discovery process and other associated details. The effort of the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences of our university will uh, certainly enlighten the path of to overcome the challenges in drug development and uh, with more opportunities uh, and with a positive uh, outcome. I would like to thank the keynote speaker for their valuable time. I also express uh, my gratitude to Dean, uh, the chairperson, the convener, organizing secretary for uh, organizing this uh, meaningful event at uh, this unprecedented crisis times. Uh, thank you so much and uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your encouraging words and for your continued support. Thank you, sir. Friends, it's time to hear from our speakers on today's topic. And for this, I request Dr. Danish Ahmed, the Assistant Professor, Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, to introduce us with our first speaker of the day. Yes, Dr. Ahmed, over to you. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it is a pleasure to have uh, an eminent personality with us uh, from uh, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, I would like to uh, thank Professor Dr. David Reel, who accepted our invitation and be a part of the webinar. I would like to welcome our first speaker of the webinar, Professor Dr. David Reel, which is a notable person in the field of drug discovery and the research. So, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Reel have uh, had uh, his BSc honors degree by the University of Dundee in 1995. Then he completed a PhD from the Royal Veterinary College, University of London in 1998. After this, he worked as a postdoctoral researcher in the laboratory of Professor Ajay Shah in the cardiovascular division at King's College London for almost seven years. Then in 2005, he took up an academic position within the School of Medicine, Dentistry and Biomedical Sciences at Queen's University of Belfast, where he is now a professor with an established independent research program. Now, some of the notable achievements uh, that includes, he is a prestigious recipient of the Inter International Society for Heart Research Young Investigator Award. 
a prestigious medical research council uk new investigator research grant in 2007 he has been elected to the committee of the british society for cardiovascular research in 2008 on which he served as a honorary secretary from 2014 to 19 currently he is a vice chair of the british heart foundation project grants committee and associate editor of cardiovascular drugs and therapy he has published uh, 57 peer reviewed papers in the cardiovascular fields in high impact journal such as circulation circulation research journal of american college of cardiology and proceedings of national academy of sciences usa he has more than 39000 citation with an h index of 27 according to the scopus particularly he has been awarded with more than 4.1 million in competitive research grant funding so uh, i would like to uh, thank professor david ree who has uh, accepted our invitation uh, to be our keynote speaker so i would i would like to request professor david ree to present the presentation for today's webinar thank you very much uh Professor, kindly unmute. Unmute. Sorry. Okay. Um, can you see my slides there? Yes. Make it full screen, please. Okay. All right. So, thank you, Danish, for that kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to participate in your webinar. So, good morning from Northern Ireland. Um, Um, so I'm going to speak today on NOx4 signaling in the cardiovascular system, which is something that I've been working on for the past 20 or so years. Um, most of this is is basic sort of experimental research, but you know hopefully it will give some ideas in terms of some of the challenges that we face in um, in targeting um, NADPH oxidase and, and reactive oxygen species signaling. um from a kind of therapeutic perspective and maybe some of the 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 questions that we've answered but also some of the um unimportant unanswered questions which we're working on at the moment so just to start with I mean we all uh, understand what oxidative stress is so in a very kind of simplistic form oxidative stress is the balance between oxidants and antioxidants and normally you know we have a, a nice healthy balance and it allows um maintenance of normal physiological um, homeostasis so about 20 years ago or so um there was quite a lot of interest in targeting reactive oxygen species as a treatment for heart failure um but unfortunately these studies were were largely disappointing and i've just given a, a couple of examples here from the new england journal of medicine and um from the lancet using these non specific antioxidants and such as vitamin E so i think that really gave us an idea that oxidative stress was a little bit more complicated than what we what we originally thought um and it's i suppose it's become apparent really um over recent years that that reactive oxygen species are very important not just in terms of um disease but also in terms of maintaining normal physiological function and i've just listed a few of them here so they're important in terms of maintaining cell differentiation metabolic adaptation autophagy stem cell function embryonic development oxygen sensing host defense and immune cell activation so we need a kind of certain level of reactive oxygen species to maintain these key physiological functions and again a very sort of simplistic um demonstration of ros but essentially um normal levels of ros determine normal physiological function but as these ros levels become um increased during pathophysiology these can lead to detrimental effects so first they can be adaptive in terms of um adapting to to stresses such as hypertension such as um ischemia etc but um when when they become high and they become unregulated then this can lead to um tissue dysfunction including cell senescence or cell death. So in terms of the heart which is the area that I've been mostly interested in for the last 20 years and reactive oxygen species um reactive oxygen species drive particular aspects of heart failure. So they're important in terms of the vasculature in terms of impairing new blood vessel formation. They're important in terms of driving cell death of the cardiomyocytes inflammation 
which is something that we and a lot of other researchers have become interested in over recent years. Um, matrix remodeling, so remodeling of the, um, the, the collagen within the heart, cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, and dysfunction of the, um, of the cardiomyocytes. And we've looked at um, particular effects of ROS on these different aspects of, of cardiac remodeling, both in terms of adaptive mechanisms, but also in terms of um, maladaptive mechanisms as well. And we've been particularly interested in the EPH oxidases. So um, there's several sources of reactive oxygen species, including dysfunctional mitochondrial, mitochondrial um, dysfunction, um, which produces ROS. Um, there are obviously xanthine oxidases um, and other sources like dysfunctional nitric oxide synthase. Um, but we're particularly interested in NADPH oxidases. And NADPH oxidases are particularly interested, we think, because um, they're the only source of ROS whose specific function is to produce ROS. Um, and so these are the, the, the main four um, NADPH oxidase isoforms, which are expressed within the cardiovascular system. And of these, NOX2 and NOX4 are the ones which seem to be most important in the heart. So this is going back quite a long time here to my um, postdoctoral position, which I, um, I undertook with Professor Ajay Shah and King's College in London. And in these early days of our research, we had a guinea pig model of pressure overload hypertrophy, um, which was induced by aortic constriction. And we showed that um, there was progressive increase in, um, in super NADPH dependent superoxide production. Um, and that this coincided with an increase in left ventricular hypertrophy and a progression um, towards heart failure, as indicated by um, pulmonary congestion. And this was associated with inclusive expression of the key subunits of NADPH oxidase. And in these days, we only knew of one particular isis form, which was called GP91-FOX, which um, has now been termed the NOX2 subunit. So we found increased expression of um, GP91-FOX together with its cytosolic subunits during progression of experimental um, pressure overload hypertrophy. And importantly, we also found the same in human hearts. So these are human hearts um, from dilated cardiomyopathy patients. Um, this is a biopsy taken from these patients and you can see increase in GP91 expression in these, in these failing hearts. So that gave us an idea that it, it, was, it was probably important. But I suppose the most interesting aspect of my postdoctoral research was really the fact that we found that um, the two isoforms, NOX2 and NOX4, which was subsequently discovered, seemed to play opposite differential effects in terms of cardiac remodeling. So in this particular paper here, we, we found that when we knocked out NOX2 or GP91 in a particular mouse model, um, we got um, reductions in, in superoxide production um, and we got a reduction in cardiac, um, in cardiac hypertrophy in response to angiotensin 2. But when we used a kind of more, um, sort of more physiological um, stress um, in terms of pressure overload, so in, um, when we used uh, aortic constriction, we found that actually um, hypertrophy was not affected um, but function was. So it seemed to be that NOX2 was important for maintaining function in this particular effect, but it seemed to be that another isoform, which we subsequently discovered to be NOX4, was important in, in driving cardiac hypertrophy in this, um, in this setting. So it seemed to be that you know, NOX2 and NOX4 played different roles, and this was dependent on the particular stress that, to which the, um, the hearts were subjected. And just taking this a bit further, um, specifically focusing on NOX2, we found that um, when we subjected um, mice to um, chronic coronary artery ligation, we found that um, these mice that, that um, were deficient in NOX2 signaling were protected against the development of um, myocardial infarction induced remodeling. This picture here just shows fibrosis and you can see function here which was associated with the reduction in nitrotyrosine as a marker of reactive oxygen species. 
And we also found um, when animals were subjected to angiotensin II again, um, that they were protected against, uh, against remodeling changes, in this case, um, um, fibrosis. And you can see here that when you actually overexpress NOx2, this actually makes the situation worse. And interesting, it seemed to be that um, a lot of these effects were driven by increases in inflammation. So it seemed to be that um, NOx2 drove increased inflammation, which drove the, the pathological remodeling in the heart. And we found that the data is not shown here, but we largely found that this was um, driven by changes in superoxide production. However, I think the most, the most interesting aspect is probably around NOx4, which um, normally, you know, say 10 years before this particular paper, it, the, the general consensus was that reactive oxygen species were bad. And we found that NOx4, which seemed to drive hydrogen peroxide signaling, was actually cardioprotective. So in these particular animals here, where we overexpressed um, NOx4, this was in um, specifically within the endothelium, we found that these animals actually demonstrated better endothelial function. So these are um, isolated vessels, and you can see that they, they, they relax better um, in response to um, acetylcholine pressure, um, acetylcholine. They have um, a reduction in the, in the coronary perfusion pressure in isolated hearts, and this seemed to be normalized when we treated these animals with catalase, suggesting that this was driven by hydrogen peroxide. At industry, when, when we took this in vivo, so we, we, um, we had this model where we specifically overexpressed NOx4 in the cardiomyocytes, it seemed to be this protected against the development of pressure overload induced um, cardiac dysfunction. And it seemed to do this by specifically driving the formation of new blood vessels. Um, so you can see in these particular hearts, there's an increase in the capillary density of these hearts with NOx4 overexpression. And relatively recently, um, we, we've, um, we've used these, we, we've, we've taken this a bit further um, and we've shown um, that particular underlying mechanisms again seem to be driven by inflammation. So it seems to be when we, when we take these animals, we overexpress NOx4 specifically in the endothelium, it seems to cause this, um, this switch to, towards a kind of more, um, more tissue protective macrophage phenotype. So we get macrophage, macrophage skewing, um, which, which can um, influence factors such as metalloproteinase 2, um, which can drive adverse remodeling. And this can, um, this can lead to beneficial effects such as increased survival, decreased adverse remodeling and preserved function. So it seemed to be, I suppose that, that there is a summary of, um, of a lot of work, I think, um, but the, the kind of take home message, I suppose, from my kind of first 10 years as a, um, as a postdoctoral researcher was it seemed to be that, well, <laughs> the take home measures, which is oxidative stress signaling is complicated. Um, but it seemed to be that NOx2 and NOx4 and an EPH oxidase is, um, play differential roles, broadly speaking, with NOx2 being detrimental in terms of driving pathological superoxide signaling and NOx4 generally being protective by driving cardioprotective hydrogen peroxide signaling. So in, in recent years, we've become interested in diabetes. So um, in, in the UK um, and in India and um, lots of other countries across the world. Obviously, diabetes is a kind of um, increasing problem, and it's particularly linked with cardiovascular disease. And I'm sure you've seen lots of different versions of this particular figure, but the worrying thing is that the, the slope of this curve is, is getting steeper. So <clears throat> 2019, but it's estimated there were 463 million people in the world with diabetes, and you can see these projected increases over the next 10 or 25 years um, are, are very, very worrying. Um, and this number keeps coming down. So um, unfortunately, you know, one person, it's estimated that one person dies of diabetes um, every six seconds. Um, but the fact it's linked with cardiovascular disease is not new. 
I mean, this is but this was one of the seminal papers written now over 40 years ago um, by Cannell and McGee, which highlighted the the link of um, of diabetes with cardiovascular disease. And we know that um, this causes various of um, microvascular and macrovascular complications um, in the brain, in the in the eye, in the heart, in the kidneys, and and in the limbs, and in the and in this, um, the central nervous and peripheral nervous system. And it's estimated that cardiovascular disease is actually responsible for about 50% of deaths in diabetic patients. And a lot of this, I think, can be um, ultimately have involvement of the heart. So this is a kind of summary schematic, which was taken from a review article that we published um, a few years ago. Um, it just really summarizes the stresses that diabetes causes on the heart. So either through high glucose, oxidative stress, various other aspects. Um, and I think, again, broadly speaking, there seem to be two aspects of, um, of the, the various stresses on the diabetic heart. And I think it's becoming more and more recognized now that diabetic patients generally have subclinical remodeling. So this means that, they, that there's maybe adverse effects going on within the hearts, which are not manifested as, um, as symptomatic um, heart symptoms. This was previously termed diabetic cardiomyopathy, um, which was initially described in, in ninth, way back in 1972. Um, but now I think that the term diabetic cardiomyopathy, which is really heart failure with no kind of underlying sort of coronary disease, is, is quite debated. Um, but I think the fact that, that patients have subclinical remodeling, which is driven by changes in inflammation, change in the, um, in the external the matrix, um, diastolic dysfunction is not so much, uh, not so controversial. And again, broadly speaking, it seems to me that this is driven by either microvascular dysfunction, which we're particularly interested. So changes within the, um, the coronary microvasculature involving reduced nitric oxide bioavailability, capillary permeability, et cetera, and metabolic remodeling. So effects directly um, on, the, on the cardiomyocytes and together, you know, this can lead to increased risk of, of um, or increased uh, worsened response to stresses such as hypertension and ischemia, um, which can lead to symptomatic heart failure and, and an increase in mortality and morbidity. So the first specific project I'm going to talk to you about today is a project that was done by Ellie and Kevin here, who are a PhD student and a, a postdoctoral researcher in my laboratory. And so um, what Ellie and Kevin did is they took um, an animal model of um, NOx4 overexpression, but specifically expressed within the endothelium. And we looked at really how this um, affected the, the development and progression of cardiac remodeling in experimental diabetes. So, so we used these mice, which had overexpression of NOx4 specifically within the endothelium. Um, we subjected these animals to streptocytosin-induced diabetes, which a lot of you may be familiar with. So we used a kind of serial model where we injected the animals with five consecutive injections of streptocytosin. Uh, and then at three months, um, because it's quite difficult to actually induce uh, overt um, carnet remodeling and failure in these experimental animals, we also overlaid a, um, a relevant physiological stress. So we infuse these animals with angiotensin 2, so to give them um, mild hypertension for, um, for four weeks um, and then, um, sorry, for two weeks, and then we looked at the um, um, cardiac remodeling. Importantly, there were no significant effects in terms of um, metabolic effects. So you can see here in terms of HbA1c, um, these levels same stayed broadly similar um, between um, between the animals. So the important, the, given um, the background that I that I that I just presented to you, and the fact that we'd um, shown that NOx4 um, seemed to be cardioprotective, we were kind of quite surprised. I think that NOx4, when it's specifically overexpressed in the endothelium, seemed to make matters worse in the di in the diabetic heart. So we um, use this um, preclinical ultrasound system, the visual, visual sonics um, vivo um, system, 
and we did serial ultrasounds in these animals. We showed that heart rate wasn't changed. Um, we showed that there were, there were only mild changes under normal conditions and response to streptotocin. But when we overlaid angiotensin two, um, we found that we got a significant increase in the EA ratio, so the mitral valve ratio. So this, this shows evidence of, of diastolic dysfunction. And we got a decrease in fractional shortening, so a decrease in the contractility of the heart when there was more um, NOx4 expressed. And again, um, just summarizing the, these a lot of data in a kind of um, in, in one slide, really, um, we found that when we overexpressed NOx4, we got um, increased fibrosis, which was associated with um, increased. Um, EA ratio. But I think the most interesting aspect really is that we seem to get broad suppression of these endothelial markers. So the endothelial markers such as NOTCH, such as CD31, angiopoietin, VEGF receptor, these were increased um, by diabetes and angiotensin 2 in the wild type animals. But when we over, probably in a, in a, as a compensatory response, to this increased um, um, increased stress um, to produce improved vascular remodeling and improved vascular signaling, um, but when we overexpress NOx4, um, we th this this compensatory increase was impaired. So we would hypothesize this is still a work in progress, but we would hypothesize that um, this increased NOx4 within the endothelium um, is actually preventing. Um, the, the, the compensatory adaptive remodeling in the diabetic heart. So to complement these experiments, we did some in vitro studies. Um, we took um, these um, aortic endothelial cells and we subjected them to, um, to high glucose treatment in the presence of, of NOx4 overexpression. We found that when we treated these animals with sorry, these cells with, with high glucose, um, we, we got an increase in reactive oxygen species generation, but this was inhibited when we treated the cells with this NADPH oxidase inhibitor. Um, we found again that we got um, increases in super, more, more superoxide being produced um, in the overexpressing cells than in the, in the empty vector expressing cells. And we, we found that by overexpressing NOx4, we seem to get changes within antioxidant gene expression within the cells. You can see we've got reductions in endothelial nitric oxide synthase expression and superoxide um, dismutase, whereas we had an increase in, in catalase expression. And interestingly, when we, um, when we incubated our endothelial cells with high glucose in the presence or absence of NOx4 overexpression. Again, this is a, a work in progress, but the, the data that we've got so far seem to suggest when we took the media from these endothelial cells with, um, with differential NOx4 expression and put them onto um, cardiac fibroblasts, that again, the, 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 the differentiation of these cardiac fibroblasts um, indicated by increases in smooth muscle actin collagen and CTGF seem to be worsened. So it seemed to be that um, increased endothelial NOx4 expression seems to be driving a kind of worsened phenotype within these, um, within these cells. So at the moment in this particular study, which we're trying at the moment to kind of finalize for, for publication, this is our kind of working hypothesis that um, damage to the, the blood vessels in the coronary microvasculature um, due to hyperglycemia and other factors, increases um, NOx4 expression, which can um, modulate antioxidant signaling, um, leading, to, um, leading to changes in reactive oxygen species, which can drive adverse effects um, on the myofibroblasts and, and leading to, to diastolic dysfunction. So I think that was quite interesting because it shows really that, that um, contrary to our previous work where we, where we found that NOx4 seemed to be detrimental in the context of pressure overload, um, and angiotensin II and myocardial infarction, that when we, um, we moved that into the setting of diabetes, it actually seemed to make the situation worse. So just for the, the last, the last um, 10 minutes or so here, I'm just going to 
run over some of our um, just recently published work, um, which is specifically looking at the vasculature and um, the, the role of NADPH oxidases. So angiogenesis is, as you know, is a very important physiological um, um, process that maintains normal wound, wound closure, embryogenesis, placental growth. Um, but dysfunctional angiogenesis can, can drive um, cardiovascular disease, including um, in the heart, as we've um, just discussed. So this project here was, was led by Dr. Carla O'Neill and Dr. David Campbell, who are a couple of postdoctoral researchers in my laboratory. And they've been particularly interested in endothelial colony forming cells, which are a specific form of endothelial progenitor cell. So we isolate these cells from, um, from umbilical cord blood, uh, and then we kind of grow them up in, in vitro um, to produce endothelial colony forming cells, or they're sometimes called outgrowth endothelial cells. We've characterized these, or my colleagues characterized these um, in, in, in depth, you know, showing they have um, high expression um, of, of, um, of CD31, CD105, CD106, um, low expression of CD45 and CD14, and increased expression of these other markers here. Um, and we're really investigating these as a potential allogeneic therapy. So, you know, can we um, take these cells um, from, particularly from cord blood, and then maybe match them to um, particular patients in, um, with cardiovascular disease um, to help um, promote or, or, or endothelial function and maybe development of these cardiovascular complications, particularly associated with diabetes. But at the moment, there's, there's quite a lot of um, um, adverse effects associated with these particular cells. So even though they've been characterized in the context of retinopathy and in terms of um, a cell therapy for proliferal limb ischemia, there's quite a few issues in terms of maintaining proper efficacy um, and um, and um, also the reaction, I suppose, of the, the, the micro, the, the disease microenvironment as well. So we would so say we published this paper earlier this year in cardiovascular research. I'm just going to present the highlights of this to you um, today. So we first we showed that these cells were very similar in terms of um, the morphology to kind of normal mature endothelial cells. Um, we showed, actually showed they function better in vitro compared to mature endothelial cells. So we used a, a basic scratch wound migration assay. We showed the cells migrated better compared to human aortic endothelial cells, as indicated by the mean data here. We showed they, they form better tubes in vitro. So this is a matrigel tube formation assay. And you can see here that the, 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 the network is more established in, um, in cord blood endothelial colony forming cells versus um, human aortic endothelial cells. And we also found that they, they seem to produce a kind of like tighter and less leaky barrier compared to um, mature endothelial cells as, as detected by this exelligent system looking at impedance across the, across the barrier. In terms of NADPH oxidases, um, the first um, clue that we had really that they were, might be important in these cells when we treated the cells with PMA, which is a, as a kind of um, source of exogenous um, superoxide. So when we treated the cells with this, surprisingly, again, we found that treating with um, a stimulus of superoxide actually made the cells function better. So we got improved migration, we got improved tube length, we got improved branch number, and that these were inhibited when we treated with um, superoxide disputase. And specifically in terms of NADPH oxidase, these effects were, were inhibited by um, VAS2870, which is a PAM NOX inhibitor, so it inhibits all isoforms of NADPH oxidase. So you can see here, there's an example with the tube network, a nice um, increase uh, in, in the tube formation, which was um, completely abolished when we treated the cells with VAS2870. And interesting, in these particular cells, it seemed to be that um, the cells ex preferentially expressed high levels of NOX4. So you can see in this particular slide, high levels of NOX4 
and small amounts of, of NOx2 um, and NOx5, but um, we, could, we've, we failed to detect any NOx1 in, in these particular cells. Um, and when we treated with PMA, we showed that the NOx4 was upregulated together with um, key antioxidants like hemoxygenase 1 and um, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So again, it seemed to be that NOx4 might be important in these cells for, for driving their, their function. Indeed, when we, when we knock down NOx4 and an EPX oxidase in these cells, both at the, um, the, the, the mRNA and the protein level, um, we found that we had reduced in vitro function through this migration assay and this um, 3D tube formation assay. And conversely, when we overexpressed NOx4 using the plasmid, we found that the cells um, function better. So we got increased migration, increased tube formation. So our hypothesis was that NOx4 could be a potential target for improving the function of these endothelial colony forming cells. Um, Interestingly, again, you may remember at the start of the, um, the, the webinar, I was um, talking about, we talked about NOx4 and the preferential induction of hydrogen peroxide signaling, but it actually seems that within um, ECFCs, NOx4 seems to inc preferentially increase superoxide signaling. So when we overexpressed NOx4, we got um, increased tube formation, and it seems this was associated with increase in reactive oxygen species generation as detected by flow cytometry, which was completely abolished by the superoxide inhibitor superoxide dismutase, but largely unaffected by the hydrogen peroxide um, and scavenger catalase, so suggesting that these effects were driven by superoxide. Then we took these in vivo, so we used um, a model of hind limb ischemia. We injected the cells, um, we, we ligated the femoral artery, we injected the cells into the hind limb here. And this image here just really shows that these labeled cells were present at day one, they were present at day seven, but by day 14, the cells had largely been cleared from the animals. And, and this was um, backed up by some measurement of, uh, of a human specific um, antigen that was measured in the terminal tissue. Um, we found again that when we knocked down NOx4, we got reduced perfusion in the ischemic limb, but when we overexpressed NOx4, we got increased perfusion in the ischemic limb, indicating um, increased um, neovascularization. Indeed, this was um, associated with increase in ENOS protein expression and an increase in vascularity. So you can see here, here this is, and the pictures aren't too clear, but hopefully you can see that there's an increase in lectin staining in the tissue from these particular um, animals should not, not um, overexpression actually drives increased vascularization within these ischemic limbs. And just finally, um, we, we then um, did a kind of proteome um, array on the tissue that was collected from these animals. And we showed a sense quite striking opposite differentiation of um, regulation, sorry, of, uh, of these particular um, pathways. So on the left here, this shows um, broad kind of suppression uh, of a lot of kind of, you know, pro-angiogenic and, and sort of pro-remodeling pathways within the ischemic tissue, whereas these were um, upregulated um, largely upregulated when we overexpressed um, NOx4, and um, again some of these ones here, which uh, which Carla expressed as unidirectional changes, were largely upregulated in the ischemic tissue versus the the knockdown tissue. And interestingly, when we when we took um, media from ECFCs which had been um, cultured um, in vitro. We again, we found that, that the media seemed to contain, and um, when we knocked down the cells, it, it caused um, opposite changes in the expression of these various secreted factors. Um, so this may explain how the cells are actually um, driving this effect, which seems to persist once, they, once they've actually been cleared by the, um, by the, in the in vivo setting. 
So I'd just like to, to summarize all this. I know I appreciate there's been quite a lot of work there and quite a lot, um, quite a lot of information there, but um, the broad conclusions, firstly, this is our paper that was published recently this year, um, which I'd, I'd direct you to. Um, in terms of the conclusions of this particular paper, we found that NOx signaling seems to play an important role in the basal regulation of cell function. Um, in contrast to our findings, both in the, in, the, in the diabetic heart, in which it seems to be NOx4 is detrimental in terms of endothelial cell function, it seems to be that NOx4 promotes angiogenic function in these endothelial colony forming cells via the induction of superoxide. And it also seems to be that, that, these, that the overexpression of NOx4 seems to direct these effects by um, induction of paracrine angiogenic signaling. So um, our working sort of conclusion at the moment is that selective activation of NOx4 signaling may increase the therapeutic efficacy of these cord blood ECFCs for ischemic cardiovascular disease and uncover novel endogenous downstream targets. Um, so in terms of the unanswered questions which we're working on at the moment, how does NOx4 specifically increase intracellular ROS, ROS signaling in, C, in cord blood ECFCs? Um, this may help us to identify um, particular therapeutic targets. How specific is NOx4 signaling? How is it influenced by other stresses such as hypoxia? And how does NOx4 regulate um, paracrine, autocrine, and downstream cell signaling. And this work is currently being supported by um, a new grant we've received from the British Heart Foundation. So I suppose in the context of this, this webinar, hopefully um, what I've presented to you um, today really highlights, I suppose, the, the complexity in terms of reactive oxygen species, in terms of NADPH oxidases and, um, and NOx4. And I suppose the kind of work that needs to be done in identifying um, potential therapeutic targets. In this particular case, it seems to be that maybe NOx4 itself might not be a particular viable therapeutic target, but it may be that you know we can identify particular upstream or downstream targets of NOx4, which might be open to particular um, therapeutic manipulation in these cells which are, um, are being put forward as an actual therapeutic for cardiovascular disease, or um, by taking forward the animal studies that we've got and um, validating that in a, in a clinical situation. Okay, so I'd just like to, to leave it there and to thank you all for attention. So these are um, our funders, which um, we wouldn't be able to do the work without, and this is a list of my um, research group. And, and also my academic collaborators in the picture of Queen's University Belfast on a nice sunny day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David Gray, for such an in-depth and informative session on NOx4 and cardiovascular system. We are very happy and we feel honored to have you as our speaker. So friends, all those who, are, uh, who have heard to Dr. Green's presentation, if you have any questions, you can put up your questions. Any questions or any doubts you have, you can put up your questions. Dr. Grief is here with us. Uh, I have a question. Hi. Uh, a very informative uh, session, sir. A very uh, uh, knowledgeable uh, research that you have done regarding the NOx4 signaling. Uh, the one question that uh, I would like to ask uh, that uh, how the, I mean, the NOx4 signaling, is it through the GPR or from any other, uh, I mean, uh, the, the receptor? So no, NOx4, no, not, not itself. So no, NOx4 will produce the, um, tends to produce the ROS, which then will activate, you know, downstream pathways. What we are in terms of GPCR, I think that's a really interesting question. So some of the work that we're doing at the moment is actually seeing how these NOx4 um, derived reactive oxygen species and the, the paracrine factors then bind to particular GPCRs. So in terms of a, a therapeutic perspective, it may be 
that you know we, we can target not for signaling by targeting particular kind of downstream PCRs either in the endothelial cells themselves or possibly on the other kind of vascular cells or um, cardiomyocytes and that's one of the key questions we're looking to address um, in one of our um, in our BHF grants at the moment but um, it's really about let's say look looking at identifying particular targets I think NOX4 is, is a very difficult thing to target specifically um, as you can see from some of the work that's been published already. Um, but I think GPCRs, Danish, is, is a really, really good suggestion in terms of how we might actually take this forward to a kind of um, therapeutic um, um, therapeutic potential. Okay, does that answer your question? Sorry, I've lost you there. Please. I think we lost. I think we've lost Danish. I think. I can hear you, uh, sir. I think I uh, there is some power uh, power connection. Uh, there is some issues, sir. Another question. Are you able to hear, sir? I can hear. Yes. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, another query from the student. Uh, he uh, he is asking that uh, uh, whether the. PPR activation, PPR gamma activation, whether it is related to the uh, to the NOx4 signal, signaling molecule, or uh, is it something related? Um, we've we've not looked at PPR gamma specifically, and I'm not aware of any. Although NOx4 is um, is considered to have um, metabolic effects. Interestingly, actually, we've just um, published a paper this week which shows that NOx2 actually regulates PPAR alpha in the heart and it seems to be that and that's in a different context so um, that's in the context of of pressure overload hypertrophy but it seems to be that NOx2 actually regulates PPAR alpha but I know in terms of um, PPAR gamma and obviously some of the drugs that are used well they're not used anymore in terms of treatment of heart failure like um like rosiglitazone, um, but it, I would imagine it's probably quite likely that NOx4 has some effect, um, but whether that's direct or indirect in terms of the met other metabolic aspects, I'm, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Okay, thank you so much, sir. sir another question, uh, there is a last question, uh, that uh, <clears throat> whether the NOx4 <clears throat> cardiac remodeling uh, whether uh, it is related to the insulin, whether it is helpful in the insulin resistance also, I mean, in a diabetic patients? I mean, we've, we've found in terms, well, I, I think what we found in terms of um, our studies, we've, that's one of the reasons I think that we've specifically looked at endothelial function is because we want to isolate the effects um, on the heart. Um, I think it knocks two, is definitely important in terms of driving um, insulin sensitivity within the within the insulin signaling within the pancreas. I think actually, I think there's, I think I read a, or, or came across a paper this week actually that was specifically looking about NOx4, and I think it's it, from memory. I think it showed that NOx4 was important in regulating um, insulin signaling via hydrogen peroxide. So um, definitely NOxes play a role within the, the metabolic regulation. And I think actually in, in one of our projects with the, the first project that I was talking about there in the diabetic heart, one of the things that I would like to do is actually specifically look at the endothelial cells and specifically look at insulin signaling in the endothelial cells themselves rather than that that's occurs secondary to metabolic effects on, on the pancreas. So... I think in answer to the question, yes, NOx4 does regulate um, insulin signaling. Whether it actually affects insulin signaling within the endothelial cells, I'm not so sure. 
thank you so much sir because uh, uh, this is a very new kind of us uh, to see that the nox4 signaling molecule is as a very very beneficial thing in a diabetes because earlier what we have seen that uh, uh, the researchers are working on glut receptors sglt2 receptors dpp4 in, in receptors glp agonist all that i mean uh, there is a they they have worked but uh, this is a very new thing that we have came across through your i mean through your research uh, through your research that uh, the nox4 signaling could be helpful in a cardiac remodeling so it's a very good thing sir it's it's very it's very context specific but it's very interesting but also very complex <laughs> Okay. Uh, any other question? If uh, uh, the speakers I would like to ask, and any speaker, if anybody want to ask any question or any query. I think there is no uh, query. So, uh, uh, Dr. Sheetal, if you can uh, proceed. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is a problem with the connection. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, Dr. Danish, you can take it up. You can invite the next speaker. Okay. Now, uh, I would like to uh, uh, I'd like to thank Professor De Dr. David Bree for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, now we are moving to our next speaker. Uh, uh, he is uh, Dr. Wahajuddin. He is a principal scientist in a, a pharmacokinetic division of CDRI. I would like to welcome, Dr. sir, uh, if you can present your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind words of introduction. Can you see me? Uh, 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 thank you very much, sir. Uh, basically, uh, Professor Wahajuddin uh, is working as a principal scientist at a division of pharmaceutical and pharmacokinetic CDRI, Lucknow. Currently, he is working with the potential molecules of CDRI uh, drug R&D pipeline. Uh, in addition to marketed drugs, metabolite, natural products, and deciphering the molecular mechanisms of ADMA disposition, he has 98 research papers, six science popularization articles, six patents, and six book chapters uh, to his credit. He has won many awards from national or state government industries professional societies and international scientific bodies, including Humboldt Research Fellowship, which is a very prestigious fellowship. Now he has been elected as a member of the following National Academy of Sciences, uh, National Academy of Medical Sciences, and Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. Dr. Wahajuddin has contributed significantly in both exploratory as well as regulatory component of new drug discovery, development, and drug research. Now I would like to uh, uh, thank Dr. Wahajuddin again to spare some valuable time for us for this webinar. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Danish. Can you see my screen, please? Yes, sir. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, So basically, uh, thank you very much for your nice words of introduction. After this research intensive talk by Professor Green, my talk will be a bit uh, light, specifically for the students, because I'll be talking about pharmacokinetics and its role in drug discovery and development. And uh, yeah, its application principles. And at the end of the talk, uh, participants would be able to understand what is the role of pharmacokinetics in drug discovery and development, how to apply uh, its principles, and how to conduct the studies, how to do data analysis, and how to come to a conclusion. So if you can see this uh, cartoon, uh, there is always a question that uh, whenever we have headache or pain in our toy, 
but we uh, take the medicine via oral route how it goes to the site of action to understand that we need to know what the pharmacokinetics is and it is one of the major uh, reason for the attrition in uh, drug discovery r and d pipeline more than around 50% drugs fail to undesirable pharmacokinetic properties uh, you may see here that uh, 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 around uh, one drug takes to reach to the market after a spending of 10 to 15 years and around 1.2 to 1.5 billion dollars and the chances or the probability of success is very less because we need to uh, 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 satisfy many regulatory hurdles for the sake of safety of human kind so if you see here this is the quantitative analysis of the kinetics and steady state relationship of the drug mainly when we administer the drug so what the drug does to the body would be the effect of drug in relieving the patient from the pain or getting treated from the disease but what the body does the drug is the study of pharmacokinetics it is basically the quantitative analysis of the movement of drug in through and out of the body so how do we uh, determine the pk parameter in preclinical kinetics uh, preclinical studies we administer the drug via oral or intravenous route and this discovery formulation is prepared by the pharmaceutical department where the peroral formulation is uh, given as solution or suspension due to the lipophilicity of the molecule and by intravenous administration we give the solution because it is directly going to be injected into the systemic circulation and then we take blood samples at various time points after dosing which is done by the veterinary scientists or metabolism and pharmacokinetic department and these samples usually are 9 to 11 sample points within 24 hours one may also collect urine and bile and then these uh, blood samples should be uh, uh, analyzed using hplc or lcms ms after preparing the samples to extract the drug from the blood and to do it one needs to develop analytical and bioanalytical methods prepare standard curves and uh, quality control samples and prepare the um, blood samples by extraction technique either by protein precipitation liquid liquid extraction or solid solid extraction the protein precipitation technique is the cheapest one and the solid phase extraction technique is the costliest one uh, but the samples we get after protein precipitation contains so much of protein and it is no, called as uh, dirtier samples and then we quantify the drug into the uh, plasma samples and construct concentration versus time curve concentration we uh, convert into log and uh, plot the semi logarithmic uh, uh, concentration time profile then we calculate or estimate the pk parameters either using commercially available software or uh, public domain software and then interpret the pk data for making uh, informed decisions so there are different routes of drug administration like per oral inhalation In inhalation, we give the uh, uh, investigational therapy in vapor gases or smoke, and uh, via mucous membranes, intranasal, sublingual, or rectal suppositories, and injection uh, by intravenous route, intramuscular route, subcutaneous route, and intraperitoneal route, and then transdermal administration of drug. So here are some of the uh, techniques of conduct of rodent pk study uh, we may do it by surgery as well and dosing by iv bolus or infusion per oral ipsc routes and sampling may be jugular vein or retro orbital plexus or tail vein then we calculate the parameter by uh, either by compartmental analysis or non compartmental analysis or iv data the uh, on the left hand side in the pink color you can see the construction of 
uh, uh, semi logarithmic part of concentration versus time profile time profile and on the right hand side you may see the uh, semi logarithmic plot for the concentration versus time profile after per oral administration so the after iv data we get the pharmacokinetic parameters as clearance steady state volume of distribution mean residence time and elimination t half from peroral data we get the percent bioavailability maximum concentration achieved and time to take maximum concentration achieved so uh, pharmacokinetic is the relationship between dose and the concentration of drug in a reference matrix usually plasma and it is what the body does to the drug and related to absorption distribution metabolism and excretion while pharmacodynamics descri describes the re relationship between drug concentration at the receptor or site of action and the pharmacological or toxicological effect produced so pk is dose and concentration but the pd is concentration in effect so concentration is a common thing in both of these and then pharmacodynamics actually is the what the drug does to the body and the readout are emax ec50 or ic50 so this is the schematic diagram that when perorally administered drug go to, goes into the gut lumen the unabsorbed drug excreted via feces and from gut wall the drug absorbed and efflux out by pgp and then some of the intestinal metabolism takes place which is also known as the first pass metabolism then via portal vein it goes to the liver in liver hepatic metabolism takes place as well as biliary secretion takes place by phase 1 and phase 2 uh, cytochrome p450 isozymes and transporters and then it reaches to the systemic circulation via heart in heart it goes to the uh, lungs and for oxygenation and then the blood comes from the lungs it distributed all over the body and from there it distributed to all over the body as well as to kidneys from where the renal excretion takes place after glomerular filtration and tubular secretion so absorption after oral dosing is uh, uh, after uh, say uh, disintegration degranulation or deaggregation and dissolution so after dissolution uh, we get a solubilized uh, uh, form of the drug and then which is uh, absorbed or permeate through the gastric uh, lining so the two per particular thing which uh, uh, takes place here is the solubilization by the use of pk and then it is followed by permeation through intestinal membrane uh, and in intestinal membrane there are different transporters which are uptake transporters for drug absorption and efflux transporter or decreasing the bioavailability or fluxing out the uh, drug and here metabolism also takes place in enterocytes so the uh, absorption which takes place in portal vein as well as intestine uh, uh, is known as pre systemic or first pass effect and uh, the drug excreted into the bile the most important concept regarding the absorption is the bioavailability then uh, distribution uh, once the drug uh, distributed to all over the body by heart it maximum concentration reaches to well perfused organs which occurs by convection or the blood flow and then its redistribution takes place uh, via tissue uh, to the tissues and via capillary bed which is also occurs by diffusion distribution into extracellular and intracellular fluid and governed by physicochemical and physiological properties that determine affinity to proteins and tissues uh, the major thing here protein binding and fraction unbound and partitioning and this barrier is offered due to the membrane properties like blood brain barrier permeability and the most important concept concept here is the volume of distribution which is a virtual uh, uh, parameter then uh, metabolism occurs primarily in the liver to increase polarity for subsequent excretion because most of the drug molecule uh, drug like molecules are highly lipophilic in nature and for getting excreted out of the body those needs to be converted into the hydrophilic uh, uh, moieties 
So here phase one and phase two uh, drug metabolism takes place in phase one. Cytochrome P450 mediated oxidation, hydroxylation, nitrogen or oxygen, uh, dealkylation, C3A4, 2D6, 2C9, 2C19, and 1A2, etc. are the main uh, CIP isozymes responsible for the metabolism. And these enzymes are located in endoplasmic reticulum in microsomes. There is some metabolism which is non CYP450 mediated metabolism uh, influenced by FML, FMO and Q, QR. Phase 2 metabolism is actually the conjugation with glucuronic acid, sulfate, and glutathione, uh, like UGT, GSP, and these enzymes are located in either endoplasmic reticulum or cytosol. And the uh, cellular fractions which contain these phase one as well as phase two metabolic enzymes are microsomes, S9, and cytosolic fractions. And other kind of uh, uh, metabolism is also there, which is uh, hydrolytic plasma or intestinal esterases, which is responsible for the degradation or metabolism of ester prodrugs. Uh, after that, the product converted into the active drug, which is responsible for the therapeutic outcome. So the drug absorbed via GIT are circulated to the liver first via hepatic portal vein, and only part of the drug is circulated systemically. Elimination also takes place via different routes like pulmonary uh, elimination, which is expiration into the air, skin, bile, but in Dubai, the drug is excreted in feces. And then uh, renal. In renal elimination, there are three mechanisms of uh, urine, formula, uh, uh, urine formation like glomerular filtration, tubular absorption, and tubular secretion. So the kidney is most important organ for the drug excretion. Uh, glomerular filtration, active secretion, and tubular reabsorption are important for polar compounds, which have molecular uh, weight less than 20 kg. Secretion of compound into the bile, metabolism and excretion together constitute elimination, and the most important concept here is clearance. Then a steady state amount of drug administered is equal to the amount of drug eliminated within one dosing interval, resulting in a plateau or constant uh, plasma or serum drug level. Four to five high half lives are needed to reach steady state. And then pharmacokinetics may follow either linear kinetics or non-linear kinetics. Linear kinetics is where the rate of elimination is proportional to the amount of drug present. And the doses increases result in proportional increase in plasma drug level. Whereas in non-linear pharmacokinetics, rate of elimination is constant regardless of amount of the drug present. Dosing doses increases saturation binding, non proportional increase or decrease in the drug level, and follow Michaelis Menten kinetics. The applications are of uh, pharmacokinetics are into different categories, like in drug dis discovery and development. We start from the cell culture to the lower animals, like mice, rats and gerbils to the higher animals like rabbits, uh, uh, rhesus monkeys, and then dog, uh, followed by the clinical studies. So when we do uh, these uh, studies in different animal species from lower to higher strata, we can also do the scaling and predict the first in human dose. The only requirement here is that we calculate the dose as well as doses regimen and the feasibility in dosing as well as delivery to either to the site specific delivery system or into the systemic delivery. Then uh, basic and clinical sciences to understand the in vivo mechanisms of ADMET and design of clinical studies for dosing regimen, timing of samples and identifying important covariates while on the therapy. Pharmacogenetics, uh, after the uh, human genome projects, we know that uh, there are different genotypes uh, responsible for the her hereditary variations. And genome-based drug discovery uh, is influenced by uh, uh, gene, uh, pharmacogenomics. 
to predict the efficacy and potential adverse effect there are different genotypes of human being which may be like fast metabolizer or slow metabolizer which largely affect the therapeutic outcome and may either lead to therapeutic failure or potential adverse effect Uh, which uh, warrant the clinical monitoring or predicting efficacy and toxicity endpoints so while doing the drug discovery studies uh, for identification of lead and its optimization what we do we correlate the pharmacokinetics to pharmacodynamics wherever it is not correlating that does mean that either uh, some metabolites are uh, being formed and those may be active because we are getting the therapeutic outcome and then it is also helpful in selecting the appropriate uh, routes of administration after uh, lead optimization we need to conduct the ind enabling studies as per the regulatory guidelines and then we do the first in human dose prediction using allometric staling or uh, physiological pharmacokinetic modeling or say in different uh, uh, species profiling and then uh, after ind filing we do drug development studies for uh, enabling nda new drug application and is it also important in dosage regimen design and optimization so during early phase drug discovery we develop validated bioanalytical assay procedures for quantification of new chemical entities as per the uh, regulatory guidelines of a particular country or a particular region in biological matrices on hplc or lcmsms the biological matrices we choose is depend on the uh, drug target location like if it is a case of malaria then we know that the drug target is in erythrocyte so we need to develop the uh, uh, bioanalytical assay in whole blood but in most of the cases if drug is partitioning into the plasma and we can use it as a surrogate we generally take plasma or serum as well for in vitro pharmacokinetic assays we do solubility log p which is permeability gastrointestinal stability at simulated gastric and spinal ph we do it to know that if there is a ph dependence in solubility and its stability in order to understand that what kind of formulation will be needed and uh, uh, the levels we may get would be sufficient to uh, elicit the therapeutic response or not and then microsomal metabolic stability plasma stability pl microsomal metabolic stability to predict the, that whether the compound would be uh, fastly uh, metabolized or it will be metabolically stable then plasma st stability because in plasma we as we uh, discussed earlier that there are different esterases and other enzymes so uh, mm, there may be a degradation of the drug and the levels may be decreased so we need to understand that as well and then plasma protein binding in order to in order to understand that what the extent of the free drug would be required and whether it is sufficient to elicit therapeutic response and whether there would be any probability of drug interactions then whole part blood partitioning or rbc uptake to decide that which particular biological matrix needs to be taken for the sample analysis and then parallel artificial membrane permeability assay in situ permeability assay or caco2 permeability assay in order to understand the permeability of the compound the extent of absorption because solubility and permeability are the two major determinant for the bioavailability of the molecule then we conduct the in vivo uh, studies in vivo pharmacokinetic studies via different uh, route of administration in which two essential are, are oral and intravenous in not, uh, rodent and non rodent species which is essential as per regulatory guidelines then tissue distribution studies uh, which shows that uh, in highly apart from highly perfused organs how much drug is reaching to uh, which particular tissue and organ then metabolite metabolite profiling what all metabolites uh, metabolites are being formed and what is their extent so if the level of 
any of these metabolites is more than 10% uh, in comparison to the parent compound, then we need to conduct the safety studies for that particular metabolite as well. And then uh, excretion studies in urine, feces, and bile, and CYP450 uh, reaction phenotyping in order to understand what particular isozymes are responsible for its uh, biotransformation. And also to, to predict the drug-drug interaction studies, then toxic kinetics studies, which is generally integrated with 28-day repeat dose toxicity in rats and monkeys, and bioanalysis for clinical PK samples. So uh, apart from those which we have already discussed, we need to also conduct the chronopharmacokinetic studies to understand that uh, by, um, the effect of biological rhythm in the pharmacokinetics. And then doses adjustments in special populations like pediatric, geriatric, obese, pregnant, and nursing mothers. These are some of the references which should be uh, consulted in order to understand the pharmacokinetics. So, so th this is all about the pharmacokinetics and its application to drug discovery and development. Uh, I have not gone through into the specific uh, case studies because I thought that uh, uh, for drug discovery and development, it is very important to understand the uh, basic concepts and their applications and the kind of study we need to do. That's all for the today. Uh, I would be happy to take the questions. Uh. Thank you, Dr. Bahaduddin, for such a wonderful session on pharmacokinetics in drug discovery and development. Uh, friends, due to uh, technical issue, we were not able to uh, introduce Dr. Bahaduddin to you all. So to do the honors, I request Professor Dr. P. Malia Rajan to kindly give a brief introduction uh, about Dr. Bahaduddin. Bah Dr. Malay Rajan. Madam, are you hearing? Hello. Dr. Malay Rajan, kindly give brief inter brief introduction about Dr. Vahajuddin. Ah uh, yes. Good afternoon once again. I want to introduce about Dr. Vahajuddin. He is a principal scientist. He is working in the division of pharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics, CDRA, Lucknow. India. Dr. Vaghajuddin is working as principal scientist at Division of Pharmaceutics and Pharmacokinetics, CDRA Lucknow, India. He is currently working with potential molecules of CSIR CDRI drug R&D pipeline in addition to marketed drugs, metabolites, natural products, and uh, deciphering the molecular mechanism of mechanism of the drug. He has more than 20, 98 research papers, six science popularization articles, six patents, and uh, six book chapters to his credit. He has won many awards from national, state, government, industries, professional societies, and international scientific bodies, including Humboldt Research Fellowship. He has been elected member of the following National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medical Sciences, and Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. Dr. Vagajuddin has contributed significantly in both exploratory as well as regulatory components of new drug discovery, development, and delivery research. Thank you. Thank 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, you can ask. Dr. Wahajuddin is with us. Uh, there are some questions. There are some questions from the audience. Like, uh, uh, Dr. Wahajuddin, are you able to hear, sir? Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, basically, uh, the query was, uh, what are the what, what are the uh, role of metabolic enzymes in a uh, in a drug discovery in a uh, lead optimization of uh, for drug discovery? Hello. Sir, are you able yeah. to hear? Yeah, yeah, come again. Because uh, somebody was telling in between about COVID-19. Okay, okay. I, uh, I request Dr. Himanshu Pandey, please uh, mute yourself, sir. Hello. Sir, please mute yourself. Okay. <clears throat> sir, uh, are you able to hear Dr. Vajuddin? Yes. <clears throat> sir, the query was... <clears throat> Uh, what is the role of metabolic enzymes in a lead optimization? Okay. So basically, uh, our body physiology was never meant for the drugs. It was meant for the xenobiotics, which may be nutritional supplements or whatever we ingest or consume from outside of the body. So body thinks that whatever co comes from outside of the body is not uh, beneficial to the body so it needs to be detoxified so it uh, it takes the xenobiotics as the toxic material and it it want to excrete it out okay so there is a large uh, enzyme family which are known as uh, cytochrome p450 and it has different uh, uh, subtypes which are known as cip isozymes which have different substrate specificity to a large variety of chemicals and other xenobiotics as well as food and other nutritional supplements and everything. So what, it doesn't differentiate that whether it is drug or it is food or it is any kind of other xenobiotics, whether it is harmful or whether it is uh, um, harmless or advantageous to the body. So what it does basically is that whatever comes into the body, uh, tries to make it more hydrophilic because the more hydrophilic it will be, the more solubilized it will be into the urine and it can be excreted out of the body, right? So when we do lead identification and optimization in that what we need, we need basically two things that the level of or concentration of, of, of potential therapeutic agent should be either equal to or more than IC50 or MIC or EC50 at the site of action for a reasonable uh, duration of time so that it has certain duration of action. After that, it needs to be excreted out of the body. So it, if it has like uh, many metabolic hotspots, it may be chopped off and the concentration of the drug may not be sufficient to elicit a therapeutic response at the site of action, number one. Number two, even if it may not be, it may not reach to the site of action. So what we need to know that what are the drug metabolic enzymes which are responsible for its potential metabolism. And if it is like metabolically very soft, then it will be metabolized very fast and the drug may not reach to the site of action or not in sufficient quantity to elicit a therapeutic response. So what we need, we need reasonably metabolically stable compounds. All right. Uh, I think uh, the query has been resolved. Uh, this is one of the participants who have asked this query. Uh, so another query, uh, uh, a very relevant query that uh, uh, one has asked, that, uh, how effective is the in silico drug discovery process that would participate in a lead optimization or a discovery of a novel compound? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
so before lead identification actually computation or artificial intelligence may work at different levels starting from the drug target identification where you one may predict the active site and if we know the active site structure then we may go ahead for like a structure based drug design if you do not know the uh, structure of the active site or the target protein then you may go ahead with the ligand based drug design in ligand based drug design what we do we do like pharmacopore modeling and substructure searching similarity searching kind of things as well as homology modeling and then followed by docking on the predicted active site if it is a structure activity i mean structure based drug design where you know the active site uh, structure one may go ahead with the direct different kind of dockings and then what you get would be virtually hit molecules which may further be reduced utilizing like ADME uh, parameters and then when you get at least in vitro hits in real world situation then you may say th these may be like lead molecules but lead molecules we may say only after when we have in vivo proof of concept so when we have in vivo proof of concept we have a particular lead molecule so here what we may do utilizing virtual screening or say uh, searching the biological and chemical space uh, in the vicinity of this potentially lead molecules that if there is some kind of toxicity then like bioisosterism principles are followed so that one can retain the biological activity but reduce or prevent the to uh, uh, potential toxicity right and there are like toxic substructure flashings which may lead to like substructure searches and we may uh, replace it so at, at that point of time we may explore to the chemical space adjoining to our lead molecule so it helps a lot okay thank you so much sir sir there is one query from jamia hamdar mm -hmm. uh, dr zinat iqbal was asking that what is the trajectory for a drug device development sir okay so basically earlier uh, like um, devices are very important and their use is increasing day by day so like drug eluting stands and other things so basic principle would be similar with some additional things what additional things that the the material which is being utilized for uh, medical devices should be biocompatible and we need to look into for how long we need to coat it with biocompatible material or some drug release uh, uh, mechanisms to make it like uh, we need to understand that it should be compatible with the uh, differentiation of the body like foreign and self differentiation like self non self recognition so basically the principles would be same but the proof of concept would be different because in medical devices those devices should have to be in the body for a longer period of time so yes uh, in these in these cases like long term studies are required and the material which is being used for making these kind of appliances or say uh, drug devices should be taken into consideration that it should be uh, 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 okay for long term use thank you so much sir thank you sir for a nice presentation uh, now over to mrs uh, sheetal charan thank you dr rajuddin for sparing time from your busy schedule and for being with us thank you so much sir for your session ladies thank and gentlemen you. let's move on to the next speaker and i'm very happy and proud to uh, introduce dr himanshu pande who is the director center for teacher education central institute of tibetan studies sarnath varanasi a little introduction about dr himanshu pande he completed his phd in 2012 from nanotechnology application center university of allahabad the title of his phd work was nanotechnology based drug delivery system under the guidance of professor avinash c pande he has worked at r and d division of morpen laboratories himachal pradesh where he has worked on various anda projects 
Dr. Pandey has been working in area of drug delivery based on low dimension carbon material, mesoporous silica nanoparticles and polymeric nanoparticles with the collaboration with collaboration with IIT Kanpur Nanotechnology Application Center, University of Allahabad, IIT BHU and IMS BHU Varanasi. Dr. Pandey has over 25 publications to his name, which also include four book chapters of high national and international repute. His research received prestigious RGYI award from DBT New Delhi and ACS SCSG grant by American Chemical Society, Washington DC, USA. Sir has received Chancellor Gold Medal by then President of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam for securing first rank in B Farm. Dr. Pandey has delivered numerous lectures at different universities and institutes to and institutes in India. Dr. Himanshu Pandey, we are very honored to have you with us. Over to you. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Good afternoon to everybody. Myself, Dr. Himanshu Pandey. I am uh, working as the director of CT in here, Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizer, Dr. Dani Samad, for inviting me in this national webinar as a speaker to uh, talk about the clinical trials. And as uh, this uh, webinar is titled as the challenges and new frontiers in the drug, drug discovery, and initially the two speakers, the two eminent speakers, that is Dr. Professor David Green and uh, Dr. Bajahuddin had uh, spoken about the various frontiers in the drug discovery. And my title is the clinical trials for the vaccine. And this clinical trial is the last phase of the drug discovery because the initial phase has been discussed by these two speakers and I'm going to uh, discuss the last phase of the drug discovery. So very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, dear participants, as we know that uh, the recently the coronavirus has uh, affected adversely the humankind throughout the globe. And coronavirus disease that is also known as the COVID-19 is an infectious disease which is caused by the newly discovered coronavirus. And uh, that's why because it is discovered in 2019 in the Wuhan city of China, this is uh, uh, known as the COVID-19. And it is the nothing but it, it is the SARS-CoV-2 uh, coronavirus. Why, what is the SARS? You might have been listening in the news that that is the and uh, SARS is nothing but uh, because of acute respiratory syndrome which is caused by this virus. And uh, most of the people we, who, who are infected with the COVID-19 virus will experience mild to moderate respiratory illness and recover without uh, requiring any special treatment. Older people and those with underlying medical problems like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, uh, chronic respiratory disease, and cancer are more likely to develop the uh, serious illness. Uh, so uh, most of the person, uh, people who are infected with the COVID-19 uh, doesn't uh, represent any symptoms. But those people who are uh, having the, uh, the serious illness, the history of the serious illness, they exhibit the uh, serious symptoms of the COVID-19 and they require, and they particularly require the treatment for that. So uh, now the question is that what is the SARS virus and what is its uh, genome? So SARS-CoV-2 is the envelope of the positive sense single-stranded RNA beta coronavirus and shown similarity with the severe acute respiratory syndrome SARS and middle respiratory syndrome that is the MERS virus. So far as the entry and the pathogenicity is concerned, SARS-CoV-2 enters into the cell through the binding of its spike protein with the host receptor that is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And these lead down to the regulation of the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. 
So uh, this lead the severe lung injury. The occurrence of the COVID-19 is elevated intense attention not within the India but also the internationally. No specific therapeutic uh, is available, and current management include the travel restriction, lockdown, patient isolation, and supportive medical care. Therefore, there is the urgent need for the management of the this COVID-19 or the coronavirus 19. so as we i have said there is no till date no specific treatment uh, is available for the covid 19 but uh, these uh, severe acute respiratory infections which is caused by the sars virus is uh, uh, managed uh, by the certain type of the hiv drug and uh, recently the hydroxychloroquine is given as a prophylactic for the risk of the healthcare professionals the available data suggests that there is no specific treatment in the modern medicine health supplements like vitamin c zinc all these things can be used so in spite of that however there are the many ongoing clinical trials we are hearing uh, day by day from the news that the clinical trials for the vaccine is going on throughout the globe italy is doing china is doing usa is doing it's that in our country also in india also the scientists are working day and night to develop the vaccine and uh, some of the pharmaceutical industry claims that the vaccines are under phase 3 clinical trial so uh, people are listening uh, daily that the vaccine are under second phase or third phase so i thought to uh, deliver a talk on the clinical trial and make the clarity regarding the what are the different phases which is associated with the clinical trials of the drug and i uh, and i want to clarify these things with my uh, today's talk now the as far as the drug discovery is concerned as i told you that this uh, uh, clinical trial is the last phase of the drug discovery and the drug discovery is start very from the synthesis of the drugs and their characterization their e evaluation in the laboratory and once the uh, the uh, primary data was very uh, is uh, very significant uh, then we go for the preclinical trial and then lastly the clinical trial as far as the uh, evaluation of the synthesized drug or the new drug is concerned we evaluate the drug for their size shape stability uh, the polymorphism uh, the stable form of the drug all these things are uh, done in the laboratory to uh, make uh, to select the uh, the good candidature of the drug which is going to be being explored in the clinical trial after that we go for the in vitro studies and in in vitro studies we uh, generally uh, perform the some laboratory experiments particularly the release profile of the drug and the stability studies all these things can be done uh, in the laboratories during the in vitro studies after in vitro studies we go for the in vivo studies and uh, the in vivo or ex vivo or uh, sometimes we do the in silico studies also so in silico study we generally uh, 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 determine the uh, scarcity of the drug or the uh, ability of the drug to bind to the our body human proteins or the animal proteins the binding efficiency of the drug to the certain receptors their actions all these things in the, uh, the do, do, uh, with the software in the computer so that uh, we uh, presume that the, out of uh, so many forms of the drug number of polymorphs is available number of the, uh, Uh, different uh, uh, functional groups are available in a drug so which of the following particular drugs is going to be fit for the clinical trial for the further studies this is the in silico study ex vivo study in ex vivo study we uh, perform the experiment on the isolated part of the uh, animal organ like isolated tissues or uh like uh, isolated lungs ito isolated uh, heart livers or certain type of the tissue for the ex vivo studies and in uh, in vivo studies we perform the experiment in the intact animal body whether it is human or certain so now the thing is that uh, since the clinical trials is a uh, costly affair suppose some of the scientists or the academicians develop a certain drugs and it is the it claims that this drug might be a promising uh, candidate for treating the certain type of the disease so uh, who is going to sponsor this clinical research because as i told you that the clinical research is a very costly affair 
so generally the pharmaceutical private pharmaceutical industry sponsor the drug the clinical trials of that particular drug which are cost near uh, millions of the dollars and uh, it uh, generally it is not possible for a professor for a scientist to uh, get uh, involved or uh, uh, sponsor these type of uh, the clinical trial which requires huge amount of money so they generally search for certain sponsors and pharmaceutical private pharmaceutical industries uh, are generally the sponsor of the certain uh, this type of the clinical trial uh, not only the pharmaceutical industry is private but the certain government agencies also sponsor the clinical trials and particularly the clinical trials of the orphan drug is uh, supported by the government agency now the question is that why the clinical trials of the orphan drugs is supported by the government agencies only not by the private agency in general because orphan drugs are those drugs which are meant for the rare disease now the question is the rare disease what is the rare disease rare disease which the disease which occurs in the millions one people in uh, one million or two millions one people are affected by those disease one is the good example is the alpha thalassemia alpha thalassemia is the disease in which our body uh, cannot be able to make the blood that is the hemoglobin hemoglobin cannot be produced sufficiently in the body due to certain disorder genetic disorder and this disease alpha thalassemia occurs once in a million people there is one people affected so the private pharmaceuticals company won't uh, uh sponsor this type of the drug which is used to treat the uh, the alpha thalassemia disease because they are not going to get the business from those uh, drugs because the number of the people affected by the uh, by the alpha thalassemia is very less so in certain in that certain cases the government agency sponsored the clinical trials of the drug so so that the drug could be able to available to treat the patient of the certain uh, disorder which is known as the Uh, orphan disease or uh, treated by the drug those are known as the orphan drugs so these are the things which is uh, required uh, for the mandatory for uh, discussing this drug is discovery phase that is the clinical trials and i want to clear that out since the clinical trials the duration of the clinical trial for a drug range from uh, 12 to 15 years it took 12 to 15 years for a drug to get approved uh, for the clinical trials and these out of the total number of drug only 10% of the drug get approved after the clinical trial means if there is a am i audible yes sir you yes, are audible sir. hello okay 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 thank you there was a connection problem so for the clinical for the performing the clinical trials and what happens in the good clinical practices we generally follow the guidelines uh, which is prescribed by the uh, different agencies like the us fda who Uh, ICH guidelines are there, and India ICMR guidelines are prescribed for performing the clinical trials. So we generally follow these guidelines for the uh, performing the clinical trials. One thing. Secondly, the human volunteers are involved in the clinical trials, and the, these human volunteers range from healthy healer, human volunteers to the disease human volunteers. Generally, we not uh, use the children, old age people, as well as the pregnant women. for the as a volunteers for the clinical trial 
and those healthy human volunteers or the disease vol human volunteers adults particularly are used for the clinical trials are initially they are uh, uh, informed about the uh, these clinical research which is going uh, which is to be going on on their uh, human body and uh, they are informed about the uh, adverse effects the side effects of the drug as well as the and the disaster uh, long time disasters of the drug which may be occur uh, in, on their body uh, so they are well informed and the 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 clinical research organizations take noc from them they are consent particularly they are consent from them that they are ready to be a volunteers for the clinical uh, research for a particular drug now for a clinical research generally first of all the company file the ind that is known as the investigational new drug that is the investigation will start from by filing the ind and generally there are the four phases in the clinical research that is for phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 and phase 4 recently the us fda has uh, uh, introduced a new phase which is known as the phase 0 and this phase 0 is also known as the micro dosing phase this is also known as the micro dosing phase and this newly uh, at phase 0 is introduced to reduce the cost of the clinical trial because sometimes happen in phase 1 and phase 2 the drug gets failed to perform and the the total money which is invested in phase 1 and phase 2 uh, is of no use because that uh, drug is not uh, performing as per as the guidelines so the us fda has introduced a newly a new phase that is the phase 0 in which uh, 10 to 15 subjects volunteers are introduced and a small amount of a drug is a small amount of a drug is introduced to assess the pharmacokinetic of the drug whether the drug is absorbing uh, sufficiently it is dispersing it is eliminating so all of the these uh, parameters generally the adme parameter is studied in the this phase zero but this phase zero is not mandatory at all this phase zero is not mandatory at all person may go directly to the phase one now what is the phase one phase one is the uh, study of, of the safety of the drug particularly the drug get uh, whether are the drug which is used is safe or not and in phase one we generally sorry hello hello yes sir you are audible sir please audible na no? okay okay so in phase 1 we take the healthy human volunteers of 20 to 80 20 to 80 numbers of healthy human volunteers are used and we generally assess the safety of the drug on those healthy human volunteers now after the uh, assuring the safety of the drug we again move to the phase 2 in this phase 2 is those known as the therapeutic exploration phase in which we assess the efficacy of the drug the drug efficacy is assessed in the phase 2 so generally during the clinical trial two parameter is being assessed one is the safety and another is the efficacy of the drug if the drug is safe but not efficacious then there is no need no need to approve the drug if the drug is effective but not safe again in this case also the drug approval cannot be given but there is certain uh, exemption ex exceptions are there because if we see the anti cancer drug anti cancer drug we know that this is the toxic drug the cell toxicity of the anti cancer drug is very high in spite of having the high toxicity we approve the anti cancer drug because the cancer is a life threatening disease and to uh, uh, to uh, save the patient from the cancer we bound to approve those type of drug which shows the toxicity cell toxicity in spite of that we approve the drug so this is the exceptional case with the cancer drug but in the rest of the cases we uh, solely assess the safety as well as the efficacy of the drug so in phase 2 which is known as the therapeutic exploration phase we generally take uh, 100 to 500 uh, volunteers human volunteers for this studies but 
the human volunteers which is used in phase 2 studies is disease volunteers means suffering from those disease for which the drug is uh, is clinically research so these are the disease people and in phase 1 the healthy volunteers are used for the safety uh, assessment after the clearance of the phase 2 we follow the phase 3 the phase 3 is the therapeutic confirmation phase this phase is also known as the therapeutic confirmation phase in which 500 to 1000 of the people the volunteers are used in which we assess the safety of the drug the drug safety is assessed in the phase three and once in the phase three uh, the, uh, the 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 randomized and the double blind uh, research or the trial is involved in this uh, experimental vaccine which is being tested against the placebo we test the vaccines against the placebo placebo is nothing but it is the uh, those uh, drug candidate which doesn't contain any active pharmaceutical ingredient means the active ingredient is not present in the uh, placebo after uh, uh, getting uh, uh, clear the phase 3 the drug can be uh, approved and it comes into the market for the Uh, uh normal for the uh, population the people can uh, purchase the drug the drug production and the marketing of the drug is start but apart from phase 3 there is the again one phase that is the phase 4 which is known as the post marketing surveillance phase in this phase after the marketing of the drug we test whether there is any safety concern or adverse drug reaction or tolerability concern is there with these drugs or not if there is certain adverse drug reaction which appears after one year or five year or four year after the marketing of the drug then what we do we recall the drug from the market and we uh, doesn't allow the manufacturers to sell the drug as per the reporting of the government agencies so these are the four phases which are uh, uh, there for the clinical trials and one thing i want to clear here also that uh, out of the 100 drugs which goes from phase 1 which is uh, clinically trial which is there in phase 1 only 70% of the drug goes to phase second and from phase second to phase third only 25% to 30% of the drugs moves and from phase third to phase four the uh, 35% of the drugs moves and from phase four to successfully successful state uh, in the market there are the 90% of the drugs 70 to 90% of the drugs successfully stay in the market for the longer time so this was the uh, certain things uh, regarding to the clinical trials the phases of the clinical trials and uh, that's all thank you so much if there is any question from the person you can ask thank you dr himanshu pandey for such a wonderful session on vaccination and clinical trial you have uh, explained to us in the most understandable words in very simple language thank you so much and uh, uh, if anybody has any doubts or any questions can put up dr himanshu pandey is with us he's there to answer your questions any questions please put up uh dr manchu pande uh, i congratulate you for such a nice presentation about the clinical trial and uh, uh, how effective it is uh, to uh, uh, relate it to the drug hello 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 yes sir can you hear yeah yeah uh, sir the participant has asked that uh, which phase of the clinical trial is the most prone to failure of the drug and why uh the most uh, we can't say that which phase is the most crucial phase of the failure because the different uh, uh, the parameter is assessed in the different phase for example as i told you the phase 1 we assess the safety concern of the drug and in the phase 2 we assess the efficacy parameter of the drug so if the drug is not safe 
okay we cannot say that this phase is very crucial and this phase is uh, the drug generally uh, uh, approved in this particular phase uh, it, it is not right to say like that because every phase is equally important and equal in first phase we phase 1 we assess the safety concern phase 2 we assess the therapeutic concern and phase 3 we assess the therapeutic confirmation so we can say that the phase 3 phase 3 is uh, uh, we can say it is a crucial because in which we confirm the uh, therapeutic uh, accessibility of the drug and in which both the safety and efficacy get confirmed in the for the larger population because in phase 1 we took only hundreds of person and in phase 2 we use only the 500 600 people so a uh, limited numbers of the persons the volunteers are assessed for the uh, is used for the assessment of the drug but in phase 3 thousands of the persons from the different caste different creed different religion regions are used for the assessing the therapeutic confirmation of the drug so the failure uh, percentage uh, might be more in phase 3 in, in spite of phase 1 and phase 2 Uh, thank you so much sir i hope the participants have uh, uh, got the answer okay. another question that uh, uh, participant has asked uh, what is the difference between ex vivo and in vitro applications of the drug sir okay see in vitro in silico ex vivo and in vivo these are the various process which in uh, in which we uh, assess the different parameters of the drug in vitro studies we generally assess the drugs in the laboratory condition not using the any animal body part or not in the intact animal body so we use the laboratories that uh, things like the uh, uh, beaker glassware scan cells all these thing to assess the certain parameters like the polymorphic forms the size the safe the release profile the thermal stability the stability against the humidity all these thing is assessed in the laboratory without using any animal or animal part this is known as the in vitro study in ex vivo studies we use the certain isolated part tissue of the animal body for performing the experiment okay for example contract Sun uh, of the muscle. We generally in the bee farm we use the isolated cock ileum of the intestine. We study the effect of the drug on the contractibility of the intestine muscles. So this is known as the ex vivo study in which certain isolated part or isolated tissue of the body is used. While in in vivo we use the drug inside the intact body of the animal, whether it is human being or certain other animal. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, sir. Good so afternoon. Some, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon, sir. Someone asked, "What is the Lipinski rule of five? Is it Sorry? Lipinski rule of five? Is it related to this particular topic?" No, no, no. I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Kori, the session has been ended. Now, over to Mrs. Sheetal, please. thank you dr himanshu for your valuable time and valuable information on vaccination and clinical trial thank you so much sir now we have come to an we have come to an end of day 1 and i request dr p malai rajan for a vote of thanks once again good afternoon good evening uh, and behalf of the swats fhs Department of Pharmaceutical Science. I express congratulations for an excellent and inspiring presentation of Professor David Grieve about his speech on challenges and new frontiers in discovery, mainly cardiovascular uh, uh, research and uh, things related to NOx4 signaling, NADPH oxidase in response to the. that means uh, uh, cardiac problem or cardiac arrest 
and he has explained very well. Thank you, sir, for your uh, years of research, your depth of understanding, your ability to present subject in such an interesting way. I personally appreciate you, your approach, explaining of the things related to the that uh, diabetics and the uh, corresponding that is cardiovascular illness in an experimental way you have explained. Thank you, sir. And uh, I thank you, Dr. Vahajuddin, for explaining about the parameters while doing the new drug development or in the clinical studies, the different pharmacokinetic studies has to be performed in uh, different uh, steps. And uh, thank you for the um, comments very timely. And we are grateful for the time and effort you took to share thought and the experience with us. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. Himansu Pante for explaining about the recent regulations of the FDA, US FDA especially, and the regulation meant for that uh, making a clinical trials in a phase-wise manner, the different phase, and how many number of volunteers and the people has to be tested and uh, he has explained the things uh, involved in the clinical trial phase. Thank you for your stimulating speech and the comments were especially helpful to the students and for your interaction with the students on various questions about in vitro, in vivo studies and other uh, area. Thank you very much, sir. I thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Rajendra B. Lal for his vision and the whole hearted support to conduct this webinar. Thank you, sir. I also thankful to Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. A.K. Lawrence, AAQA, Academic Affairs and Quality Assurance, sir, for his continuous support and motivating speech for this occasion. Thank you, sir. Our sincere thank to Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. S.B. Lal, administrations, sir, for his guidance and support and our uh, thanks are due to Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Sarvajit Herbert, planning, monitoring, and development for his encouragement. I thank our registrar, Professor Dr. Robin L. Prasad, for standing with us in academic journey. I thank Engineer John Wesley, sir, Joint Register Administration, and Chairman, Social and, and Media Committee for designing this webinar and uh, for your uh, technical support for doing this webinar, sir. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. Richmond Samuel, University Chaplain, for enlightening our mind with spiritual insight and lead us in the opening prayer. I thank all the directors, deans, principals, head of various departments, faculties, researchers who encouraged us to have this successful webinar. I appreciate the initiative and enthusiastic effort Ahmed, Assistant Professor of Pharmacology and convener of this wonderful webinar. I thank you, sir. I thank all of the organizing committee members and the faculty members for their sincere efforts and involvement. I thank all the students, particularly participants from India, Nepal, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, and other countries for their uh, your patient hearing and their meaningful interaction with the experts. Without your participation, the webinar will be unsuccessful. I thank you one and all for this today's seminar. I hope you have enjoyed this seminar. I invite you for tomorrow for the continuous session. And uh, please join with us by tomorrow 1.30 at the same time. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you, sir, for a vote of thanks. So, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear students, kindly join us tomorrow at 1.30 for day two. And I hope today's session was uh, very helpful to you all. Thank you so much once again.